five years. And uh, so I hope I sound better to you than I do to me. Uh, I've known Luke since he was conceived, I think. I know his mother since she was a willow with long red hair. So this is a great pleasure. I'm going to read kind of old stuff and, and do, mostly because I love booksellers, and they have some of these books. So if you read it, if you say, I'm going to read new poems, you don't read from the books they have. The bookseller chases you out with a stick. Anyway, this is, <clears throat> choosing what to read is always silly. I, when I first saw Melbourne Books, I thought, oh, they named it after me. No, they probably named it after Charles Olson, or Herman Melville, or Joseph Langland, or Chaucer. But for this evening, anyway, I used it in a poem, so I will read that poem. This is the tenth poem of a sequence of poems called River Songs. In it, there's a guy who's stuck on a raft in the middle of the Missouri River. A lot of things happen. But in the last one, there's a man on a bed in a hospital. He's being fed with IV tubes. He's being drained by a catheter. And there's a girl skipping rope outside his window. There are a couple of things. There's an Italian passage in it. Just means the world saved by the children. And I guess you need to know that the woman is called, has to do with birds, is Sacagawea, whose name means bird woman. So that's all. So it begins with the uh, skip rope. In came the doctor, in came the nurse, in came the lady with the alligator purse. That moving window of rope, the haze shape that swings, boundaries or hazards, once he lived here, often taking a morning walk or afternoon stroll along this street. Did you know her once forgotten the lady? <coughs> Surgical implements and appliances still lived on the porcelain table. The delicate tubes that feed and drain hang translucent curves coaxial. A flexible bedside straw angles from a smudged water glass like a cut stem. She held her gloves in one hand. The limp fingers spread like petals dark and wilted above her fist. Beneath her dress were her crossed legs pressed tightest she ground nylon on nylon, yet to another breath. They count in song or sing the alphabet, adding syllables to match the jostle of their step. In verses, some words are merely breath. Silences are sometimes spoken. Go in and out the window. The ropes click on the pavement, springs the half circle out of shape. The projector loop stutters and Pasolini dances. Il mondo salvato dai ragazzini, toe caught and falling through the flickering hip casement. The descent beckons. She cranks the head up and turns his face to the window. Late light sluiced past choke cherry across occluded eye. The brown water threads its sludge, the sprung branch of a fallen elm, trail curls of yellow scum turning as the catheter bends southward. There weren't no home like a raft, after all. Each spring the land spills back with the receding floods, the slag of the gray flats hooked with rubble, stiff weeds strung with drying mud. The river's harvest bobs in the dark current. Her hair swings and jostles the dance the mud encloses, coagulated drops slowing the turns, thick choke cherries bead the light. At Malvern, the trees, Thwaites, Jim, Buckeridge, Guthridge, the fisherman, Lewis, the birdman, the woman expecting flight as she calls the river's slow turns, the lady shifting in her chair, pulling the strings of her beaded sack, Snapping the Florentine flowered clasp, click the recessional song and dance. Out went the doctor, out went the nurse, out went the lady with the alligator purse. <clears throat> One of those things you love in childhood, never quite get over. Skip rope songs. 
This is a little poem I wrote for a class of mine. I was trying to uh, have them think about different ways that an iambic line could happen, uh, and different ways that rhyme could happen. <coughs> the, the final line is, is uh, from a rhythm of blues song called Cantalina. Buds, husks, leaves, and flowers gone. The ordinary city tree at dawn. The usual traffic, expected fumes, automatic music in darkened rooms. Dance step, disco, action weather, jive. Top of the charts, only the strong survive. Oh, that's enough for this guy. Uh, It's called Apples. So it's dedicated to Robert Creeley, uh, in part because the, uh, the murders of the taxi drivers in Buffalo uh, were reported to me in a letter from Creeley, so I wrote this back. And it's about uh, these places along the north Indiana, the north border of Indiana on the Michigan shore, where you could go buy apples and peaches and things like that from farm, the farmers along the road. So, the news, precious little to hold on to, cuts and burns. In Buffalo, six taxi drivers murdered their hearts cut out and carried away. Lebanese shards. All across the country, victims sprawl. Terrorists in New York. In Indiana, just south of the dunes, brown cider is put out in Dixie cups. Apples cinched up in plastic bags along the floor. Jonathan's red and golden delicious wine saps, frost-skinned Cortland's roams. Shelves of amber, home-strained honey, prize-winning gourds. At the edge of his new blacktop parking lot, Anderson, the owner, tries to explain the two turkeys in his yard to three Vietnamese loading apples into a blue Chevrolet. The tom fans his tail and struts along the bellying wire fence. Look, look, he says, waving. Wine sap, as though responding, topple and roll every which way. The Vietnamese smile and nod, pointing at what Anderson and his turkey have just done. Autumn and gravity, apples unevenly spinning, feathers flurried above bright asphalt. America, he says, America as though this were their chance to see it all at once, part question, part exclamation, an explanation insisted upon in the moment that lost his hands at his sides. They are nodding, yes, yes, palms pressed together, the scattered apples at rest. Perhaps it is always true that each occasion is its own, its own center, that it, its moment, the wobbling wine sap stem is the axis to our irregular pasts, motions that curve inward as they fall across contending radiance, waves of news and weather invisibly symmetrical and lost among the leaves. That's this one. This has a CD in it, so I'm advertising. <laughs> I've written a fair number of poems about music, since David's here, uh, writes brilliantly about jazz. I'll, uh, he didn't even smile, he just took it, right? Uh, I'm gonna read a poem about Miles Davis and Nebraska. It's called Summer Night. It's just about driving along, and in those days, as you went along the prairie, it was never actually flat. Texas is flat. The prairie in Nebraska and I, and I goes like this. So you would come in and out of the music because you had just had an old radio. This is like 1956 or 57. So the car is going up and down, the music is coming in and out as you go. The rest is perfectly clear, I think. Elmwood is this tiny town between Lincoln and Plattsmouth, Nebraska. And then Palmyra will turn up, and that sounds rather classical, but 
all those Midwestern states took names from antiquity or the Bible. So there are Hebrons all over the place and, and uh, Galilees. So this is Palmyra. Summer night, Nebraska, <clears throat> circa 1957. Passing through Elmwood, its single amber warning light swaying above the pavement, orcas, stray wings, and bug spears jewel the windshield. The 1948 Oldsmobile radio clutching distant music, its reach scraped along the prairie's flat water shale, suddenly empty this summer night, the vague constellations, cornrows spinning the way. It's miles in retrospect, of course, and Gil Evans, that a thin line the trumpet draws along the horizon, one darkness defining another, and clarity, the song, songs receding and intermittent play prairie grasses back at us. Kansas City, Omaha, distances diminished, cool in the horn's muted restraint. Going home or nowhere in particular, the night air greened with cooked alfalfa, new world sharp and stinging, ponca and pawnee, quick as thought among the cottonwoods belongs. The song argues where the music takes you, each measure measuring out its own place, syllables, summer night, or a static hiss, empty and disquieting. Somewhere north of Palmyra, heading east, crossing and recrossing the river's meander, the highway lifts and falls, sound then silence, the land shadows interrupting musics we play ourselves into, doing 70 at least. Speak up, I can't remember your name, so many years, hand, arm, bracelet, and bare knee. Like a pebble dropped in still water, pebbles, each one flashing rings in the dark, in time, that time, or this. Chicago in its own moment, fingertips yours, stroking the air across the radio's chrome grill work, the fret lines of numbered light, white walls strumming warm asphalt, the blues reckoning evenings north and east by starlight and city dancers slick with sweat. Summer at rest in the past, Miles Evans, Highway 2, each present always merely remembered, its particles rearranged, car radio prairie, a knee raised only slightly, the tick of night bugs swirled up against glass, death trailed off or fluttering, Elmwood recalled for no reason, its one traffic light, a crystal pulsing crystal song. Another music piece. This is uh, uh, called Chinatown. There's a section in Chicago called Chinatown. Then there's a section in Bridgeport where the mafia lived, which is called Chinatown, but it's not in Chinatown. <coughs> and uh, my friend Bill Russo, the composer, arranger, and head of the Chicago Jazz Ensemble, did a jazz piece called Chinatown, so I wrote this. Uh, and it's about the relationship of names to privilege. Chinatown. It's how they said it, like Tangerine or Cherokee. In Bridgeport, that is. Chinatown. Where are you from? Meaning, what neighborhood, what street corner? Chinatown. A privilege more certain than Taylor Street, deeper perhaps by misdirection. Not Chinese in any sense. Not Chinatown proper, merely adjacent to it, but meaning something else altogether. A special sense, not of place, but of value. Value acquired in place, acquiring place, as in Chinatown. Well, Lucas was talking about poems that my favorite teaching poet is uh, Virgil, <coughs> who in the Georgics told you how to do things. How to, how to, uh, how to milk a cow, how to plant a field. Uh, a friend of mine, who was a poet in Iowa, uh, Armand Bell, called to say that he had to give a reading at a place in Iowa, and he needed a poem that had an Italian past 
and that would be of interest to farmers who had just finished harvesting their crops. Challenge. So this poem is called a Georgic from Martin Bell. Virgil talked of corn, of farmers at their work, the shadows that move up their hillsides at evening, rain, sunlight after rain, and cloudless skies. Of plants that rise up unbidden and bear no fruit, birds and their plunder, and salt land and, gra and gravel, and rich soil that falls black from the plow's shear. Of land flat and glad with moisture, of stubble left fallow, and the crust on unstirred fields, fierce sun and frostbite. How in time the crop levels the furrow, how mildew devours the corn stalks, how thistle and bees can overcome a crop, as thistle and burrs can overcome a crop. And of the farmer at home, sweet children clinging to his knees, the holidays kept in the sacred piety of his household. Out of the shade of a spreading beech, Virgil sang of fields and flocks and trees, of bees among ripening apples, shrill locusts, haylofts, and brimming <clears throat> water troughs, and thought of tillers marched away, the plow's measure of honor gone, of Caesar bending sickles into stiff sword blades, and hurling war's lightnings at the high Euphrates. Should have dedicated to George W. Bush. <laughs> <laughs> Well, Lucas asked if I was going to read something new, and I'll do that too. <coughs> so many poems. So many poems, so little time. This is the title poem for this uh, collection. It's called uh, Cinema, Cinema Universale. In the old days, when I was young, nobody else here, maybe, and movies didn't kick you out at the end of the movie. The movies just started at noon and they went till midnight. That's called continuous showings. And it would say in front of the Orpheum of the Paramount Theater, continuous show. So this, this is uh, about continuous showings. In those days, there were continuous showings. You simply went to the movies whenever you liked, noon to midnight. And an usher with a flashlight and wearing a uniform would walk you down the aisle, the flashlight forming an ellipse across the figured carpet just ahead of him. And people would stand up in sequence. Excuse me, you were expected to say. The movie, in medias race and technicolor, was already in front of you. And in that awkward moment, leaning slightly forward, sliding your feet sideways so that you wouldn't step on the toes of people whose fronts your back was brushing against, pardon me, excuse me, trousers, jackets, sweater, blouse fronts, ties, whispering, you seemed about to fall into it. The movie, that is. Those monumental faces, a bosom rising, lips drawn up into a famous pucker, kisses as real as Monument Valley, the sudden brightness of bright places flashing all around. Frank Sinatra and Doris Day, for example, his cigarette and her smile, and Gig Young completely out of his depth, as out of place as you were tilting toward them, not yet part of the audience, a participant of sorts in the way that someone edging across a high window ledge participates in air. Mm -hmm. Sitting, taking your seat, was like being pulled back into the shadowed safety of the ordinary room inside the window. And the picture became, in short <laughs> order, a story, its middle proposing a beginning, a world of commonplace occurrences in which Doris Day moved about apparently unaware that she was Doris Day. And Sinatra was eased into town like a gunslinger, something only he and Ethel Barrymore knew from the start. And loving them both equally, regretting Gig Young's broken heart, you knew with Ethel that it would come out badly in the end. That in time, song wears away its singer as death unsteadies the gunslinger's hand. How many cigarettes and how many saloons 
How many fingers of red eye? How many Dorothy Malone's town after town? You wait for then her sorrow and his moment of 